Welcome to the Farcast. I'm Alex Helmbrecht, and I'm joined with my co-host, Daniel Binkard. Our guest today is the esteemed Dean of Deans at Shattern State College, Dr. Jim Margetts. He's the Dean of, of Liberal Arts and Essential Studies. And I say he's the Dean of Deans because he's been here the longest, but just a couple of years ago, that wasn't the case. So no. I suppose you've outlasted everyone else. <laughs> I think it's like a good game of Survivor. Maybe. Right on. <laughs> but uh, Jim, thank you so much for joining, joining us today. Um, much like how we had our conversation with, with Alaric, uh, the newest dean mm-hmm. um, earlier this week. We're sitting here in the dean's green, so it's a it's a lovely place for an interview, and and uh, hopefully the the clouds stay a little bit overcast and we don't get sunburnt. Uh, yeah, it'd be nice because I'm prone to that. So. <laughs> well, hey Jim, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where did uh, where'd you grow up? What's what's your background? Where'd you go to college? All that good stuff. <laughs> okay, well, uh, so I grew up mostly in metropolitan Salt Lake City in Utah. Uh, my family has a long history there. I was actually born in Seattle when my dad took a job with Boeing and then home called. So they moved back. And so all of my memories are from there. And uh, it's a nice place. Beautiful mountains, you know, all that stuff. Uh, I went to college at Brigham Young University, which is about 45 minutes south of Salt Lake in a town called Provo. It's not really a town anymore. It's more of a city. It's grown quite a bit since I was a student there. But What's the enrollment there? It's over 30,000. I don't know exactly oh, what wow, it so is. Oh, wow, so much but larger. Yeah, it's big. When I was a student there, I'd say it was probably about twenty five or 26,000. So it's they've expanded a little bit since then. Um, and I went to study music. I, I had been taking piano lessons with the professor who taught there when I was a teenager. And so it was kind of a logical transition for me to go there. And then after I graduated, I... Uh, dipped my toe in the water and I went to school at the University of Rochester in New York for about a semester. I didn't really find it to be what I was looking for and so I eventually I went back to school at the University of Cincinnati and that's where I got my master's and doctorate in music performance and piano. Okay. So Jim, how long have you been here at CSC and uh, what what are the roles that you've had here? <laughs> So um, I'm actually starting my 17th year this year at Shadron State, which seems uh, incredible to me that it's been that long. Finally legal to drive. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I still feel like I'm learning things all the time. But I originally came in 2004 as a faculty member in the music department. I was uh, hired as a piano instructor, and so I worked in that role for about 10 years. At that time, uh, the dean that we had had previously left, and so there was an opening for an interim dean. And I had been the chair of the music department for about three years and found that I kind of liked some aspects of administration. And we, in the program that I was in in music, we had decided to rotate the chair duties among all the faculty. And so it had been about, I don't know, five years out from last time I was in there, and, and I just thought maybe there was something that was attractive to me there. So I took the interim job, and uh, it turned out to be a good match, I think. I, I like to think I'm, I'm uh, valuable there, and so I signed on, and I interviewed for the full-time position, and I started that in 2015, and so here I am, and I'm still doing that. I I my role has expanded a little bit, I guess, since then. But I still basically do the same things that I did back then. What What would you say a normal day for a dean of liberal arts is like? <laughs> How many fires do you have to put out? Yeah. Oh golly, well, so uh, normal day. I, you know, I I feel like I answer a lot of emails every day. That's probably no different from a lot of people on campus. I think uh, because of the particular role I play here, I am over student concerns. And so I do get to put out some fires. It seems like there's something that comes up every day or so. Uh, Some of my days uh, each day are spent meeting with faculty members, mostly the faculty in the school, and uh, listening to their concerns or helping them find funding for different projects that they're doing or just checking in with them to see if their classes are going well. And then uh, the other portion of my day is probably spent in meetings where we do some strategic planning or just talking about how to improve things or how to resolve problems and stuff like that. That's that's a typical day. I mean, I mean this is actually kind of an enjoyable day. I've been looking forward to a chance to come outside. 
especially with the, the way things have been going with COVID, I, our meetings that used to be, I, I was thinking today, in fact, I had my first face-to-face -face meeting this morning, probably in about three weeks. And ordinarily, before all of this happened, I would have probably had five or six meetings a day that require me to actually get up and, and walk across campus. So I kind of miss that. Yeah, I feel more productive actually oh, during, yeah, yeah. during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. It's kind of interesting. It's it's you, it is kind of a you know you have five meetings a day, and mm -hmm. if there are ten minutes to get there and and all that stuff, then you always need to take that time to kind of get acquainted with the room and situated with everyone in there. <laughs> and so I, that doesn't happen on Zoom. You you just kind of this is the task at hand. Let's discuss it. Okay, talk to you later. Yep. It's yeah. that getting stuck behind your desk for the full eight hours or more. And uh, I, I found my job, I'm moving around quite a bit anyway, but I was definitely moving around less, uh, especially in the spring. So it's like, I've got to keep that in mind and get that blood flowing. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, it's a real thing. Jim, so as a dean now, like you mentioned, it's kind of an administrative position. But has it historically always been sort of that way at colleges? I mean... Um, when, when we talked to Alaric uh, earlier this week, he mentioned something about how uh, where he came from, the, the, his previous institution, department chairs was kind of more of an administrative gig. Um, and, and here I think that chairs have some administrative duties, but maybe not necessarily to the extent that he was referencing. And so I'm just kind of curious about kind of the historical evolution of, of the dean. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's an interesting position for sure. It's I've had to explain it in front of a lot of parents and students when we have orientation and things like that. I think deans initially were much more involved with just sort of overseeing things and and being figureheads, I guess more or less, uh, you know, important or people to look up to hopefully and people to come to with questions and maybe sage advice. I think it's evolved and certainly here it's much more, there's much more of an emphasis on day-to-day -day administrative tasks, like including the types of things that at a lot of larger schools are, are carried on by uh, department chairs. So it's kind of a hybrid position. One, uh, one thing that deans do at larger schools that we don't do is that they go out and fundraise a lot. So they are responsible for meeting with donors, potential donors, and, and raising funds for various initiatives that are going on in their schools. And we here, I don't know if it's because of our size, but that's not something that, that deans do. But those, those kind of duties, cultivating goodwill, going out and, and promoting the college and that, that seems to be what deans do. Uh, some of what I've heard is that deans also do a lot of, uh, I don't know if infighting is the right word, but they <laughs> sort of among themselves trying to advocate for, you know, variable or various uh, issues that maybe they need to, to kind of get in line for with the other deans. There's usually a whole bunch of deans and yeah, I don't know. It's it seems more of a political position at other places than it is here. I just had like a like a scene in my head of like pigeons flocking to someone on a park bench <laughs> with pieces of bread. Yes, or yeah. That doesn't happen here though. Oh no, <laughs> no. It's actually it's a much more collegial environment here. That's one thing I really like about it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, so, Jim, this is one of my favorite questions, and I usually ask it for, like, um, behind-the-scenes videos for theater or, or other projects because it, it's always a good talking point. What's the value of a liberal arts education, and why should I take these classes in stuff that's not my subject? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, that comes up a lot, and especially lately. I think uh, I was just reading a survey that said that 77% of uh, adults – question the value of college and I think a lot of it is related to that particular issue what you know why why am I taking those classes I try to tell people that I think really there are two major values the one is maybe a little bit lesser than the other the one that is obvious I think is is when you're learning content in a variety of other disciplines it helps to widen your knowledge base so you might learn more about history or geography or something like that. 
And I tell people that that sometimes can benefit you. For example, if you're having a job interview and you find out that your the person interviewing you that might be your potential boss has a background in art and you took an art history class and you can talk, you know, with relative knowledge and not not to embarrass yourself too much, you know, about just some basic artworks and things like that. I think that can be an advantage. And I think anything we learn can we can add to that knowledge base and it can deepen our ability to really interact with other human beings. But I think uh, deeper than that maybe is are the underappreciated skills of maybe learning how to, first of all, present a reasonably argued argument in favor of some, you know a position that you take and learning how to distinguish between reliable sources and unreliable sources, learning how to think and listen to other sides of an issue and recognize that wow, maybe there's some value there. I think that kind of approach to teaching in the liberal arts is really valuable to everybody across other disciplines. You know, you read studies that business schools are really disappointed when the students don't have more of an ability to demonstrate soft skills, like being able to have a conversation, to be able to give a speech, to be able to give a presentation, to be able to write. Well, I think all of those things are built into the fabric of a liberal arts education. I think the value is mostly, though, I think the uh, becoming a better human. I think becoming a more empathetic person, becoming a, a more civil person, somebody who's interested in giving back and thinking about other people at least as much as himself or herself. You know, I think those kinds of things resonate with me. Well, in my opinion, things like that will never go out of style. I mean, no, I agree. Yeah. So explain essential studies. That's kind of the other <laughs> half of your title. I don't yeah. know if it's the other, if it takes up the other half of your, of your time at work, but explain that to us. Okay. So uh, every college, every, every college that uh, offers a baccalaureate in, of arts or science requires a set of courses that are usually called general studies and so at Shadron State, about 10 years ago, a group of faculty members got together and wanted to improve the general studies program from more of a checklist approach where you sort of say, well, I have to take a math class, I have to take a science class, similar to what experiences you have in high school, right? And to try and integrate it a little bit more into a cohesive plan of study that makes sense and, and combines things together where you can kind of build on what you're learning and come out on the other end with a set of skills that, like we talked about before, help you to maybe be more marketable as a potential job seeker and also deepen your humanity a little bit. So uh, the Essential Studies program is, consists of 12, well, 13 courses that a student takes in 12 different subject areas. And so it starts out with first year inquiry courses where freshmen are invited to come in and take a course maybe in a subject area that they have interest in, hopefully, or at least are attracted to. Uh, some have funny titles like Monsters and Magic, which is a course we're offering this semester. But it's designed to kind of appeal to students' basic interests and help them to learn how to become inquisitive again, maybe, about how to learn more about a subject. So from there, then we have a set of classes that build on basic skills. So we have a uh, English class that's required of everyone, math class, a communication arts class where you learn to give oral presentations, and then um, science. So those, those kind of core areas you think about in, in a regular education. Then another set of classes uh, focuses on different ways of viewing uh, the world. So you have a, human a humanistic view. You look at it from a scientific view. You look at it from a social sciences or humanities view and, and try and just maybe get experience using different lenses to see situations and problems. There's a set that talks about uh, more involvement, whether it's in civic affairs, global and social awareness, figuring out how to, um, uh, how to take care of yourself, wellness, health and wellness, and well-being, um, that sort of thing. And then it 
concludes with a capstone experience where you try and synthesize all of those experiences and complete a final project that helps you kind of use what you've learned in all of those previous courses to have a really well-developed idea, be able to articulate it, to be able to explain it and show that you un can understand it from a variety of different viewpoints and perspectives. So that's what our Essential Studies program does. It's 39 credits, and it, you know, is supposed to sort of stretch across a four-year degree plan with a few courses each semester that culminate, like I said, in, in this kind of capstone achievement experience. Well, the, the way you just described it there, and I mean, I, I'm familiar with it just because of my job, but it, it really sounds like a mini program of study. It is. And, and I think that that's really, I think that's really cool. We're always trying to find ways to make it better and to figure out how we can demonstrate the value. You know, that's, it's hard sometimes with things that are subjective to find ways of measuring growth in, you know, am I able to think more critically now than I could three or four years ago? How do you measure that? It's, it can be tr tricky sometimes, but uh, we think it's a really uh, kind of a gem among the regional schools. There are very few schools that have gone that route, except for private colleges and universities. And so we feel like it's something that makes Shadron State uh, it's unique. It sort of sets us apart from a lot of other schools in the area where we combine affordability with that. Excellent. Yeah. Jim, can you tell us uh, briefly, say, take a couple of the popular classes in this program and um, what makes them unique? <laughs> okay. Well, let's, let's, uh, let's take Monsters and Magic as an example. So uh, in that particular course, uh, we're using some references to popular culture, I think, and, and especially looking at literature, TV and film, depictions of monsters, depictions of uh, magic. You know, I mean, you can look at Harry Potter, which was uh, still is popular, but for most of these students, they grew up with that as a just a fundamental part of who they are. And so to to use that as a gateway to kind of get inside and find answers to questions that maybe they hadn't considered before is is one way that I think we kind of move from the known to the unknown and in a way that is kind of intriguing and exciting and, and gets people excited about stuff like that. Uh, one of my favorite classes is uh, taught by one of our faculty in liberal arts, Dr. French Collins. Um, it's a class called Event Planning and Leadership, where a lot of the students, uh, it always has a wait list. People want to get into that. It's, it's a class that's designed to help students learn how to develop their own skills in leading by going out and actually planning a service project, planning some kind of an event. And uh, Dr. French Collins is really good about incorporating feedback. You know, they have to assess what happens at every stage along the way. And so it really gives them a complete experience because they start out really knowing very little about what to do. They learn the basics, but then they also follow it up with how did we do? How could we do better? I think it's really, those kinds of classes really prepare students to step out and become immediate contributors when they get out into the workforce. And so that's a good example of combining kind of career skills with very practical kinds of um, skills that can can also just be used across society in various ways. So there, there are lots of other examples. I, those are the two that come to mind right away. I always like hearing that word follow-up, especially when it comes to event planning <laughs> from, from uh, my experience. I'm sure. So that's great. Well, Jim, uh, shifting gears, let's talk about the piano. Okay. Uh, you've taught piano for well, a number of years, right? Mm -hmm. um, what do you miss about that, uh, not being able to do it regularly? That's a really good question. I, I think my feelings about it have changed. I think when I first left, I was I was excited to try something new, but it didn't take too long for me to miss the the daily associations with students, I think, is the number one thing. And being able to see the students' growth from the time that they first come till the time that they graduate, that was one of the things that attracted me to this position when I came. I had been t I was teaching at a community college in Colorado before I took the position. And 
one of the attractive things was to be able to start out with a student as a freshman and to be able to follow the student for four years. And so I miss that. I miss that. In fact, I recently had a chance to catch up with about three or four of my uh, students who still live in the area. And we were just reminiscing about some of the fun things that we did, you know, field trips that we were able to go on. Uh, performances that we gave as uh, I used to direct the keyboard ensemble. And so we used to give a concert at Christmas time every year called Mallets and Ivory with the percussion ensemble. And I, those are the things I miss. I think more than that, I, I do miss playing the piano too. I mean, I having that job gave me an excuse to practice every day. I can't say that I'm able to find the time in my current schedule to do that. Uh, when I took the job, several people suggested that I replace the conference table in my office with a grand piano and that it could maybe serve a dual purpose. But I knew I wouldn't be I'd be too tempted to practice and not uh, enough to to do what else needs to be done. Right. So how important, you know, you, you reference community college students and and um, four year college students here. But how important is early childhood music training? <laughs> Well, that's something I really believe in strongly. I I think you know, but I, it's it's one of those subjects. I think there are many like it, but I think it, early childhood music training really opens. There's a lot of research that indicates that it just it opens pathways in the brain for uh, a lot of creative development for young people. I think that's one of the things that attracts me to looking into it. I think a lot of times we think of when we think of uh, maybe classes, uh, people who don't have access to, to the ability to develop in that way. Um, we a lot of times think of, I don't know, urban areas where there's a lot of large population centers and, and people just don't have the ability to, um, to have access to early education in, in music or anything else, you know. And I, I find that that really makes a big difference, not only for students who to pr continue to study music, but also uh, just in their schoolwork in general. I think there's a lot of uh, advantage to being able to make connections. Music study begins with music literacy a lot of times, and it usually starts with the voice. And so student, you know, young children learn to find their voice. They learn how to sing. They learn how to express themselves, and they gain confidence in the ability to do that. And then it translates pretty easily to instrumental music from there. And so they can, a lot of times, uh, piano playing, I'm biased a little bit, piano playing supposedly uses the brain more actively than any other instrument. So because it requires two hands to be playing often independently of one another. Somehow that translates up in the brain into releasing more neurons and, you know, getting things excited about going on there. I, I think, too, I just think that music comes naturally to children. And I think, you know, the, the program I taught in for a long time, uh, the mantra was, you know, every child is a musician. I mean, you know, everyone can can make music. Everyone can sing, you know, and it resonates with me because my dad, when he was in third grade, his third grade music teacher told him to stop singing because he couldn't sing. And, and he used to sing to us when I was a kid. He used to sing at night sometimes when he was putting us to sleep and he had a lovely voice, but he never believed that he could sing because that third grade teacher said he couldn't. And it took his whole life for him to overcome that, you know. So I think by extension, I think early childhood music education can really open the possibilities to, to any child and can help them. It just kind of gives them an, a leg up on everything else that they might want to do in the future. I, I would think it probably helped them with counting, too. That's, that's, the, <laughs> well, that's the thing that I was, I, I was in a, a terrible we thought we were a punk band in, <laughs> in high school. And that's the thing. I, I would play bass guitar. And I was self-taught, not very good. And I would always get lost in counting. <laughs> and, and the guitar player would be like, hey, we got to go. We got to transition. Mm -hmm. And I, I would just get repetitive with it. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, those kinds of things come in handy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's my, good. Maybe that's just my own. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think issue. so. <laughs> no, I always wonder if, if my parents had had me taking piano lessons as, as a young boy, if how that would have turned out. 
because I, I I wish I had the uh, oh the impetus to learn it now. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's like, well, that's kind of feels like it's not going to happen. And it probably would have been more likely with that uh, growing up. But who knows? Yeah. You can teach an old dog new tricks. Oh yeah, you can. Yeah, <laughs> there is a, there is an advantage to just the the naturalness of you know you you don't think about it as much when you're a child. It just sort of comes out, you know. And as adults, we tend to overthink things sometimes and make it complicated sometimes more than it needs to be. Yeah, I I also believe very much in uh, adult music making too, though I think it's never too late, and it it can it can provide joy and and that sort of feeling in a, in a different way, you know, it may not, doesn't always manifest itself in complete mastery of, of an instrument, but it can bring a lot of satisfaction too. So. Well, I'm, I'm so glad to hear someone as, as talented as you say that the, the joy is more important than the mastery. So oh, whether absolutely. you're singing a stupid made up lullaby to get your toddler to sleep <laughs> or, or whatever, as long as you find some joy in it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a, um, I think that's a kind of a, a metaphor you could take throughout your entire life. Well, that's a huge gift you can give to a child too. To sing to a child, it's much like reading to a child. You know, uh, when they're young, I think it um, it demystifies it. It just makes it a lot more natural and normal. And and I think it, it again it just paves the way for great things. So, Jim, I understand you have a, a sort of a Japanese connection. Can you tell us about that? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, when I was 19 years old, I volunteered to uh, serve a, vol- a mission, a church mission for my church. And they, uh, the process is something like, you know, you say, I'd like to volunteer and I'll go wherever you tell me to go. And so I received a letter a couple of months later, back in the days of snail mail saying, uh, we'd like you to go to Japan and uh, work there for two years, just meeting people, learning the language, teaching them uh, more about what our, our church teaches. But it was, uh, it was a really great experience, um, formative in many ways. But I gained a real appreciation for Japanese language, for um, Japanese food, for Japanese customs uh, that I that still I think carries with me. It's still part of part of who I am. I do think getting back to what we were talking about earlier. I think my musical training helped me to learn the language more fluently than maybe some of my peers because you know it develops your ears. You have to learn how to very sensitively like listen for inflections and nuances and things like that. And so. Uh, although I, my vocabulary wasn't ever huge, but I, I did, I could get around. I never learned how to read the language because it's very complicated. They have three different character sets that they use and they have two sets that are kind of like A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And so everybody learned those. I could read, you know, those phonetically, but the, the kanji characters, the, the Chinese characters that they use are, they're beautiful to read there's just harder and I, I when I came home I decided to when I came I, I took a basically two gap years from my college to do that and so when I came back to school I had I was able to get credit for being able to speak and and understand Japanese language right so I got some some clep credits for that but I signed up for some classes and learning how to write kanji and I finally had to give it up. I, it's the worst academic experience of my life because it took so much time to do that. And I was also expected to devote myself to my major. And so, but uh, they're beautiful people and uh, very humble and very, very um, sincere. They also are uh, what I found really interesting about the, some of the controversy that we had here in our country surrounding wearing masks. You know, everybody wore masks in the wintertime in Japan. So it, I didn't really think of it as a big deal because I, for two years, I walked around and everybody had masks on to prevent colds and flu and stuff like that. And so uh, an interesting little tidbit. But um, I still like making Japanese food every once in a while. I, I I'm grateful for the foreign, you know, the food stores that I, where I can buy uh, some ingredients that I can't get at Walmart. And uh, 
that kind of thing. But it's it's an important part of my of my life. I'd love to go back sometime. Uh, we'll see. And I can attest to the food because I was at a conference with Jim a few years ago. <laughs> And we went to a Japanese restaurant, and I was going to order something, and he's like, no, you did not want to order that. <laughs> <laughs> because I had no idea what was on the on the menu, and so that was a, a lovely dinner. Christine Fullerton joined us that, yes, that night, too. So yep. um, that was a good time. Yep. Now... You, you're all you're a man of many mysteries. One of them is you're a big sports fan. Talk yeah. a little bit about some of the teams you follow. Well, I do. I am. I. Uh, it's a little bit surprising to some people, especially people who knew me as a kid, because I was very. In fact, my uh, my first non classical concert I didn't attend until I was thirty years old. So, so that's I've had to do a lot of back tracking to be able to catch up to most the you know your average 80s teenager but i um but i really uh sorry i gotta take a drink here um i uh wait a minute i've lost track of what the question was sorry sports teams thank you how could i forget so um, college football is was one of my favorite sports. Um, I grew up cheering for BYU uh, Cougars, and uh, eventually some of their best players, um, Steve Young, played eventually for the San Francisco 49ers and won a couple of uh, Super Bowls. And uh, so I started following NFL after that, you know, and, and the 49ers were kind of my team, along with the Seahawks, because I was born in Seattle, and that was kind of the only connection I had there. So... You know, Salt Lake um, only had one major sports team. They came in when I was at about 12, the Utah Jazz basketball team in the NBA. And so that's my favorite pro team. I mean, I, I, I live and die by what they, how they perform. They just, a couple of weeks ago, they lost on a heartbreaker at, the, at their playoff game. And, uh, you know, it usually takes me a day or two to come down off of those those kinds of things. But I do enjoy following um, the NBA. And, and then I also, like I said, college football and college basketball. Basketball is probably my favorite sport. So so watching the, the recent Michael Jordan documentary oh, brought painful. back some bad memories Horrible. For you. Yeah, The Last Dance. I, <laughs> I made myself watch it, but I, um, yeah, there were, some, there were some painful memories. It was, it was, uh, Colleen and I joke about it, my wife, because we lived in Cincinnati. I was in grad school. The two years, it was after being a fan and being disappointed so many times, they finally, they made the NBA championship two years in a row. The two years, the, the first two years after I moved away. And so back then, of course, the internet was in its infancy. And I remember she makes fun of me because I would stay up late and watch the dial-up internet change the score like from one digit at a time <laughs> like it would change you know and like then two minutes later it would change over again and and so I but I didn't miss any games I mean I was like die hard back then and yeah it was it was painful it was painful sorry to bring it up it's okay <laughs> it was it was kind of fun to see the you know see the footage from those times mm -hmm. and it was kind of fun to relive that They've never quite returned to that stage again. They've never quite returned to that level. But, uh, but yeah, no, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be with them. I, I recently became a Huskers fan, though. I, I went to BYU, uh, Nebraska game, and that really kind of turned the tide for me. Even though BYU won, it was a hail mary. I don't know if you remember, but um, I, I've never been treated so well by fans, and they were so yeah, nice. Cool and so it, oh, uh, I. Um, yeah. And and now that I've lived here for 16 years plus, you know, I feel like a Nebraskan. I for many years I felt like a Utah and I just, you know, kind of cherish that identity, but um Nebraska's our home now. So So kind of closing out the uh, main interview questions, uh any other interests and hobbies you'd like to tell us about in particular? I have a note here that says ask Jim about Whitney Houston. <laughs> That's my guilty pleasure of the 80s, I suppose. I had the biggest crush on her when I was in high school. Her voice and just her the personality. Oh, and great voice. I always felt, uh, 
I, 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 the, if you mention Bobby Brown's name in my presence, I usually get angry because I, <laughs> she, I, she could have done so much better, you know, for herself. So she, but no, I, I do, I have a soft spot for, um, for Whitney Houston songs. I used to, in my eight or in my, not my eight track player, I'm not quite that old, but in my cassette deck in, in my car, I used to play uh, her albums when I was driving back and forth between my home and my college. And, you know, I, I just have, have a lot of good memories of that time. And, and it makes me think I wasn't quite as nerdy as I thought. Maybe the, there's one thing that, you know, I, one set of pop music that I, I listened to before I kind of, when I got married, um, we drove across country from our reception to college. And, it was like a three-day trip, and Colleen spent the whole time educating me on 80s music. And <laughs> so we listened all the and 70s music. And so now I can name pretty much any artist that I, but not so much back back in the day. Whitney was, Whitney was it. I had a poster. I had, I mean, it was a pretty big deal. So but at least you had one. Yeah, you know, that's something. Wish I could have heard her in live in concert at some point. Yeah, you know, that would have be been. But anyway. Well, Jim, we've reached the point in our interview where we have some quick hitting questions. So we've got five. <laughs> okay. We've got five blazing questions coming at you. So the first thing that comes to your mind, but the first one actually is more of a definition. Okay. What is Cincinnati chili? It, <laughs> is it, or is it Cincinnati? I always feel like you need to say it. Oh, with Cincinnati. An, yeah. Yeah. With, so. with an accent. But what what is Cincinnati chili? It is a kind of a meat sauce that is flavored with like cinnamon, nutmeg, uh, sometimes chocolate. And it's, it's, I think it has Greek origins, but it's served over spaghetti noodles. And you heap lots of shredded cheddar cheese on top. That's called a three-way. If you add beans, like kidney beans, that's a four-way. And if you add onions to it, it's a five-way. It's this very interesting delicacy. I either love it or hate it. I loved it. My wife hated it. <laughs> that sounds so, pretty good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can remember growing up at uh, cafeteria food, we'd have chili mac. Like, I like mean, it's not mac all that different from that. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> so it's the just... real deal. If you if you ever have the chance, if you're in Cincinnati or in the neighborhood there, um, Skyline Chili, Gold Star Chili, there's a couple different franchises that are, it's kind of like Runza is here, I think, kind of. But, uh, man, it's good. Every time I go there, that's the first place I go. That meal sounds like something my dad would whip together when my mom had to work. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I'll take some of this. What's yeah. part of mom? I don't know. It's going in. <laughs> uh, Jim, one of your favorite movies? So my all-time favorite movie, this is going to make me sound really sappy, but I love It's a Wonderful Life, and I still cry every time at the end, even though I've seen it hundreds of times probably. Um, I... I love screwball comedies. I I watched um, I, one of my favorites is What's Up Doc. I don't know if you've ever seen that. It's about a musicologist. That's one of the reasons that I think I liked it so well. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, I could go on. But those those are two favorites that come to mind right away. Other than the piano, do you play any other instruments? <laughs> I did. So I I played violin when I was in late elementary school, early middle school. And uh, then I gave it up. I, my teacher told me I needed to learn vibrato, which is what they do when they vibrate their fingers on the, the string. And I couldn't do it. And I like playing the piano more, so I quit. Um, I played the ukulele in fourth grade instead of the recorder. But I can't play any of those instruments now. It would be embarrassing. What a rebel. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, what is some of the best advice you received as a college student? Uh, probably my senior year, uh, I had a class that I didn't go to uh, because I was behind <laughs> in the workload. And uh, my teacher called me up and said, why didn't you call me? We could have worked something out, you know, instead of. And so that was I still consider that some of the best advice that instead of avoiding problems or instead of. Uh, just walking away from them. The the best thing to do is to, even though it's hard, is to have that hard conversation to go in and, and do that. So, And finally, Jim, what is one word that comes to your mind when you think of Shattern State College? Underrated. How's that? That's a great one. Okay. That's a great one. 
that rounds out our questions, Jim. We really appreciate you taking the time and and uh, kind of having a a matinee conversation with us. I got to use a music term, maybe. Thank you. Uh, but a, a conversation with us here on the Dean's Green. We really appreciate everything you do for CSC, and thanks for chatting with us. Oh, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. Enjoy all of your work. Thanks for making us all look good. <laughs>